Okay, turn with me, please, to uh, Isaiah 64. We're going to read from Isaiah 64, verses 6 through 9, and two verses from James 5. Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities." But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. And then turn with me, please, to James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. James 5:17 Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of 3 years and 6 months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit Let's pray Great God of heaven we ask that We may learn from the Puritans on the very important and vast subject of prayer. Teach us, Lord, to pray and give that we may learn from this lecture, this sermon, things about prayer that we've never known before, and that we would leave this place not just feeling guilty at the poverty of our prayer life, but being motivated to put more focus by thy grace upon prayer. Teach us now, we pray, and again we pray, help us to follow the Puritans insofar as they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our subject this afternoon is the Puritans on prayer. The Puritans on prayer. Yesterday, we looked at the Puritans on receiving and doing the Word of God. And then we looked at the Puritans on meditation. And today, we want to look at a third subject from the Puritans that help us in our Godward life, namely prayer. And then tomorrow, I want to conclude this mini-series by looking with you at the Puritans on sanctification or holiness. Now it's interesting that in James 5, in the King James Version, or the Authorized Version, there is a note in the center column when it says, Elijah prayed earnestly. The note says, Elijah prayed in his prayer. The original Greek can be translated that way. You see, so many times we pray, but we don't really pray. We say words, but they don't go above the ceiling. We don't have our heart in it. We are not totally engaged in our prayer. A man may pray with his lips, and yet not pray with an intense desire of the soul. Prayerful praying, or praying in your prayer is always prayer that is moved by the whole man. Your entire soul is involved. And that is what the Puritans have to teach us. A number of years ago now, 30-some years ago, I studied at Westminster Seminary for my doctorate in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
And as I studied in Reformation and post-Reformation theology, that was my degree, and I read hundreds of sermons and books by Reformers and Puritans, I, I grappled with the question, why were their days so much better than our days? And I couldn't find an answer in their writings. I mean, they wrote well, but there's a lot of men today that are writing well. The content wasn't that much different from what the God-fearing are writing today. And finally, I concluded that the difference lay not just in the sovereign dispensation of the Holy Spirit, that too, of course, but the difference lay in the fact that these men were wrestlers in prayer. They had learned to pray. And that in our day, we have far too much prayerless praying. And I begin with myself. I then turned to Isaiah 64, and I read in verse 7 God's complaint of Israel that no man takes hold of him in prayer. And I was convicted that one of our great problems, maybe our greatest problem in the church of Jesus Christ as believers today, is that we are not great wrestlers in prayer. And the giants of church history, the Reformers and the Puritans, dwarf us in this important, critical area of prayer. And when our prayer lives are weak, our lives and relationship to God are weak as well. Take, for example, Martin Luther. Luther regularly spent two hours a day in prayer, which is a well-known fact. His prayer life is legendary. But when he was facing a day in which he was going to be extra busy, he said to his right-hand man, Philip Melanchthon, Philip, I have so much to do tomorrow, I need to spend an extra hour in prayer. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but when I'm extra busy, my prayer time is abbreviated. Luther's was expanded. And the reason why, you see, is because too often for us, prayer is an appendix to our lives. It's something we tack on. For Luther, the Reformers, the Puritans, prayer was their life. Prayer was the thermometer of their soul. Prayer was the essence of their being. And so they prayed their way through the day and through every activity of the day. Prayer was absolutely critical. Philip Melanchthon once overheard Martin Luther praying. Luther, you know, always prayed aloud, even when he prayed secretly. Because he said, I want even the devil to hear my prayers. And I also want to be able to concentrate when I pray, so that my mind doesn't wander and offend God. But when Melanchthon overheard Luther praying one day, he went back home, and this is what he wrote down. Gracious God, what faith, what spirit, what reverence, and yet with what holy familiarity did Master Martin pray? And you see, that's it. When you're a prayer warrior, there's a holy reverence, there's a holy familiarity, and there's faith in your prayer. And you really believe that God will answer it. Now, that doesn't mean that prayer came easily to Martin Luther. Luther readily confessed, Praying comes close to being the most difficult of all works, he wrote. It's a difficult matter in hard work. It's far more difficult than preaching the Word or performing other official duties in the church, and that is the reason why it is so rare. John Welsh the son-in-law of the famous reformer John Knox, prayed six or seven hours, don't even try it, six or seven hours a day in prayer. He used to say to his wife, I don't know how a person can sleep through the night and not get up for a time of prayer because the needs of the world and souls are so great. 
He kept his robe close to his bed because he would get up in the night, robe himself, and then go over into one of the cold rooms in northern Scotland to pray. And his wife would often find him there, but she wouldn't dare open the door. It was too sacred, she said. So she'd stand outside the door and she'd say, John, honey, don't you think you should come back to bed? You're going to catch a cold or pneumonia. And he would say through the closed door, Oh my dear, I have 3,000 souls to care for. His church was 3,000 members. And I know not how it is with many of them. And so he'd be praying for them one by one in the middle of the night. Well, there are many such examples among the Puritans as well. Thomas Brooks said, Ah, how often Christians... Has not God kissed you at the beginning of prayer and spoken peace to you in the midst of prayer and filled you with joy and assurance upon the close of prayer? The Puritans and Reformers were wrestlers with Almighty God. Another Puritan, Joseph Align, was a great prayer warrior. His wife wrote of him after he died that he used to often complain if a blacksmith could be heard pounding on his anvil at four o'clock in the morning before Joseph Align was at prayer. He said, how this noise shames me. Does not my master deserve more than these? Well, why are we so prayerless today? For one reason, we don't take hold of ourselves and we don't take hold of God the way we should. And so we come to God's throne with empty hands. We're not really believers in prayer the way we ought to be. And God's complaint comes to us as well. No man takes hold of me. God delights it when a sinner takes hold of the kingdom of heaven by violence, by the violence of prayer. And claims God's promises. And wrestles with them for divine benediction. So how do you do it? What are the solutions to this tremendous problem? Well, I want to divide this address into two sections. Number one, I want to give you six reasons, six ways rather, to take hold of yourself to take hold of yourself for prayer. There are things that we can do when it comes to prayer as believers. And then I want to give you four ways to take hold of God in prayer. And all ten of these are grounded in Puritan and biblical teaching. Six ways to take hold of yourself in prayer, four ways to take hold of God in prayer. Number one, remember the value of prayer. Remember the value of prayer. You take hold of yourself when you consider how valuable prayer is. Even unanswered prayer. William Bridge, one of the most godly Puritans, said, Prayer is a treasured gift of God, even though it never be answered. You see, just the freedom to call on God and to pour out your heart before Him is a great gift. When I was nine years old, my dad sat me down one day. My dad used to give me lots of instruction. And he said this to me. He said, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is that a believer always has a place to go. What a blessing to have an open throne of grace. To be able to pour out like a child sitting on his father's lap, to be able to pour out your needs in the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. There's nothing quite like it. And by the way, John Calvin himself said in one of his many definitions of prayer that prayer means to climb onto the lap of my father and lisp my needs in his ears. There's something beautiful about that relationship, even when prayer is never answered. William Carey, the great famous missionary in India, labored for eight years before baptizing the first convert from Hinduism to Christ. 
And yet Kerry said that he learned to live in those years, those eight years, more for the glory of God alone than at any other point in his life. He said, I feel it is good to commit my soul, my body, my all into the hands of God. Then the world appears little, the promises appear great, and God appears as my all-sufficient portion. You see, God's delays became marrow for for Carey's soul. And that's why the Puritan Thomas Brooks said, you must distinguish between God's delays and God's denials. It's a mercy to pray, though we never receive the mercy prayed for, but often the mercy prayed for will come in due time, in God's time, and in God's way. And that's why we need to understand that in prayer, there is almost always a waiting time between the sowing of prayer and the reaping of answers. And during the time between sowing and reaping, the plants are growing. And so it's in our waiting times that we often learn more than in our answering times. And we learn to depend on God more. We learn to trust Him more. We learn to have a more intimate relation with Him, even when He does not yet give us the answer. But if unanswered prayer is sweet and valuable, how much more valuable is answered prayer? The Puritan Joseph Hall said, Good prayers never come weeping back. I either receive what I ask for or I receive what I should have been asking for in the first place. You see, sometimes God does much more than we pray. He does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. And so, if you want to be a prayer warrior... You need to refuse to leave the Lord alone. You need to keep before you the encouraging words of the Puritan Thomas Watson. It was the angel that fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. Prayer is behind the mighty works of God in this world. And we need to beg the Lord to bring back the days of John Knox when his enemies dreaded his prayers more than the armies of 10,000 men. Number two, take hold of yourself by maintaining the priority of prayer. The priority of prayer. John Bunyan, one of the greatest Puritans, wrote this, You can do more than pray after you pray, but you cannot do more than pray until you prayed. Let me repeat that. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Pray first. And pray often, said Bunyan, for prayer is a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge for Satan. One time, about 20 years ago, I learned a valuable lesson in prayer. I was uh, preparing a sermon, I was typing up some thoughts, And I had this urge to pray. But I said to myself, well, I had three or four thoughts in my mind. I wanted to get them down. I would put them down first and then I would pray. By the time I got them down, I had no urge to pray. And I realized that prayer and the urge to pray is always more important than anything else we're doing. Pray first. Pray first in everything that you do. Give priority to prayer. And when the urge to pray is there, make sure you don't snuff it out. Number three, speak with sincerity in prayer. Speak with sincerity in prayer. I spoke about long prayers, but I now want to encourage you that often our best prayers are our shortest prayers. You see, God, said Thomas Brooks, does not look at the elegancy of your prayers to see how neat they are, or at the geometry of your prayers to see how long they are, or at the arithmetic of your prayers to see how many they are, or at the music of your prayers, or at the sweetness of your voice, or at the logic of your prayers, but he looks at the sincerity of your prayers, how hearty they are. 
It's critical when you come before God that you're transparent and sincere and wholehearted in your prayers. Thomas Brooks goes on to say, the true mother in Solomon's day would not have the child divided. So God loves a broken and a contrite heart, and he hates a divided heart. Come before him with all your heart in sincerity. Number four, take hold of yourself by exercising a continual spirit of prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. And that refers to the habit and the spirit and the condition of prayer rather than the physical act of prayer. You can't always be praying, can you? You've got duties to do. So what does the Bible mean when it says pray without ceasing? Well, one time there was a group of ministers in John Newton's day who got together every month to discuss theological questions. And one month, this was their question. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? And they gave a bunch of answers, but none of them were satisfying to them. And so there was a young lady who was waiting on them. She was bringing them refreshments. And they said to this young lady, perhaps you can tell us, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? And she very humbly said, oh, sirs, that's really quite easy. She says, when I get up, And I dress myself, I pray, Lord, clothe me with the righteousness of Jesus Christ afresh. And when I bring you uh, bread and, and, and drink, I pray, Lord, let Jesus Christ be my bread of life and my water of life today. And when I came down and dusted the room before you came, I pray, Lord, take away all the dust and filth and sin from my heart. And I just kind of pray my way through the day like that. Well, that's what it's all about, you see. When you're close to God, isn't that true? When you're close to God, you're praying your way through the day. You've got lots of spontaneous prayers that just go up to God with your eyes open throughout the day. You're praying for this. You're praying for that. You're praying for everything you do. That's the attitude, the spirit that the Puritans advocate in prayer. Joseph Align, who I mentioned before, once wrote this in a letter to a dear friend. He said, When I'm not living a close life with God in prayer, I feel like a bird out of my nest. And I'm never quiet again until I'm in my old way of communion with God through prayer. Like a needle in the compass, I am restless till it be turned to the pole of prayer again. You see, continual prayer is the unexplainable spirit and art of daily communion with God, sometimes hidden from the wise and prudent, but revealed to babes. That's why it's so critical that we pray our way through each day. Number five, we can take hold of ourselves in prayer by working towards organization intercessory organization in our prayers. Think of the Apostle Paul here. He was constantly praying for believers in churches all over the world. He was a busy man. His life was full of conflict and trial. Yet he maintained a system of prayer. He regularly prayed for the Corinthians. He regularly prayed for the Thessalonians. He regularly prayed for the Philippians. What a beautiful thing that is. I had a very dear friend in South Africa. I've been to South Africa a number of times, and his name was Dr. Martin Holt. I'm sure some of you know him. He was a great uh, Reformed Baptist preacher. And uh, Martin Holt got up at 5 o'clock every morning, and he prayed for two hours. And he, he had a prayer book. He showed me the prayer book. He had a stool before his desk. You could see the grooves in the stool, the wooden stool where his, where his arms laid, where he prayed every morning. And he showed me that some people he prayed for every day, some people he prayed for every week, some people he prayed for once a month. 
And he remembered all these people. And my wife and I and our three children, all five of us, he remembered every single day. Do you realize what that meant to me? I know that every single day, my brother Martin was lifting up my worthless name before the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. What a blessing he was to me. And what a blessing you can be to others. When you engage in intercessory prayer for them on a regular basis, and do it even to those who seem to come against you, love your enemies. Think of Moses when Miriam was trying to usurp his place and she got leprosy. Moses didn't say, oh Lord, kill her now. But Moses said, hear now, O God, I beseech thee and heal my sister. Would that be your reaction? You see, you can't remain an enemy of those you pray for. Prayer is a wonderful thing because when you pray in an intercessory way, you draw near to those to whom you pray for. Prayer is a great blessing in intercession. And too often our prayers are selfish and we don't pray the way we ought for those around us and those among us. And number six, take hold of yourself by keeping biblical balance in prayer. The Puritans speak a lot about this, that we shouldn't just pray selfishly. Perhaps the, most, the best way to say it in a more modern way is to use the ACTS formula. I'm sure you've heard of that. A-C-T-S. Begin with A, adoration. Just begin your prayers by adoring God, telling Him how great He is, how wonderful He is, extolling His attributes, praising Him for His gospel. Saying thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift of his son. And then C, confession. Confess your sin. Your known sin. Pray for forgiveness even for the sin that you don't recognize. Ask God to make you aware of it. Make you a sin hater. And then T, thanksgiving. Thank him for all his many benefits to you in every area of life. And then comes, finally, supplications, spreading out your needs before him. Such prayer, said Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, is the highest activity of a Christian in this life. We faint because we don't pray. Keep this biblical balance in prayer. But now we also need to learn to take hold of God in prayer need to learn to take hold of God in prayer. This too takes grace. This takes a special grace of God. Let me give you four ways. Number one, we need to learn to plead better than we do God's promises in Jesus Christ in prayer. God's promises in prayer. You see, in God's sovereignty, God has bound himself to his own promises. One of the old Puritans said, True prayer is taking hold of God by showing God his own handwriting in his own promises. You know, not so long ago, there was an old elder in my church who was downsizing his house and he was going through all this old junk. And he happened to find a letter written to him by my father shortly after my father was saved, as as in his late 20s. And the whole letter was very spiritual. He gave me the letter, and he said, as I read it, and I was getting very excited about it, he said, maybe you'd like to keep a copy. And I said, keep a copy? I would love to have this. Can I keep the original and give you a copy? He said, yes. And I treasure that letter till today. This was my father's handwriting. But can you imagine how God feels when you and I have his holy word written over 1,600 year period and we can bring his own handwriting back to him, turn his word into prayer and say, Lord, do as thou hast said. That pleases the Lord 
immensely. Now behind me in my study at home, I have a shelf of about 10 prayer books. The prayers of the Puritans, the prayers of William Jay, the prayers of Charles Spurgeon, the prayers of Edward Bickersteth. And I have those books right near me because if I get a bit discouraged or I get depressed with my own miserable prayer life, I, I, I pick out one of those books and I, I begin to read. And as I read, what I discover is that 90% of the prayers of these great men of God is simply Scripture brought back to God again. These men have learned to take hold of God by taking hold of His promises in prayer. The Puritan John Trapp said, Promises must be prayed over. God loves to be burdened with and to be importuned, that is, urgently pressed with requests, in His own words. Yes, to be sued upon... By his own bond, prayer is ultimately a putting of God's promises into suit. And therefore, it is no arrogancy nor presumption to burden God, as it were, with his own promises. Such prayers will be near the Lord day and night. He can as little deny them as he can deny himself. Another Puritan, William Grinnell, put it this way, Prayer is nothing but the promise reversed or God's word formed into an argument and retorted by faith back upon God again. Furnish thyself, therefore, with arguments from the promises to enforce thy prayers and to make them prevail with God. For the promises are the ground of faith, and faith, when strengthened, will make thee fervent, and such fervency will speed and return with victory out of the field of prayer." So I say, the mightier any is in the word, the more mighty he will be in prayer. Now that leads me then to say, secondly, we take hold of God, not only when we take hold of his promises, but also when we read the Bible itself for prayer. You see, one reason our prayer life is drooping is that we neglect the scriptures, Prayer and communication with God is a two-way conversation. God speaks to us through His Word, and we speak back to God through prayer. Have you ever tried to have a one-way conversation with someone? It's pretty tough. Last week, I had a dear friend in Canada who was on his deathbed. And I called up, actually I was the last person to speak to him, and I called up, called him up, and his wife answered, and she said, he can't speak anymore. I said, well, can I talk to him? She said, yes. And so she held the phone by him. And what happened? Well, I talked to him for a minute or two, and I, I, I ran out of words. And I said, well, can I pray? And I prayed, but I couldn't hear anything back. Until finally when I said amen, I heard just a remote, thank you, thank you. And I was so glad I heard even that. But it's difficult to have a one-way conversation with someone. And so when God speaks to us through his word, he wants us to speak back to him through prayer. To have a two-way communion with God. And when we do that, you see... When we read the Bible and pray, read the Bible and pray, as we saw the other day with meditation, we experience a taking hold of God in prayer. And that is a beautiful thing indeed. Because then God's Word seems lively to us, our prayers seem more lively, and there's a real communication with the Most High God. Number three. We take hold of God in prayer when we lay hold of the entire glorious Trinity in prayer. You see, much of our prayerlessness in our prayers is due to our thoughtlessness towards God. The Puritans used to say, in prayer we commune with all three of the divine persons of the Trinity. And they based that on several texts. They based it on Ephesians 2.18, For through Christ Jesus, 
we have access by one Spirit to the Father. You see, what the Puritans are saying is that prayer is like a golden chain that runs from the Father's eternal decree through the Son's merits and by the Spirit groaning it out in our hearts and it goes back up through the Son's sanctifying graces and He presents our prayers back to the Father. True prayer originates with the Father, merited by the Son, moved through the Spirit, through us, back up to the Son, and it ends ultimately with the Father. This is a glorious way of taking hold of the triune God in prayer. In fact, the Puritan John Owen wrote an entire 450-page treatise on communion with each person of the Trinity. And he did so based on 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And Owen used that as a paradigm for experiential communion with God. He said we commune with God through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the love of the Father, and through the comfort of fellowship by the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is the way to take hold of God in prayer. Now Owen went on to say that normally in prayer, even when we use the Father name, we're addressing the triune God. But there are particular times in prayer when we may wrestle with one particular person of the Trinity according to that person's special work. Now, when it comes to prayer itself, you could pray directly to the Holy Spirit, couldn't you? You could say, Holy Spirit of God, groan within me, Romans 8, 26, groanings that are unutterable. Or you could pray directly to the Son of God, because it's also His specialty, and say, prayer giving, prayer hearing, prayer answering, Son of God, hear my prayer. Or you could pray to the Father, because He's the origin of all prayer, and He's decreed your true prayers. But in other areas, you see, you could only pray to one person. When you pray for sanctification in your inner man, you pray to the Holy Spirit, don't you? Because that's His particular work. So what Owen does is he has a wonderful list in his Communion with God book. It's a wonderful list of about 10 to 15 things where it would be best to pray directly to the Son because that's His particular work. And another 10 things or so where it would be best to pray directly to the Holy Spirit because that's His particular work. But then he says, I need to be careful here because for the most part, when we go to God, we pray to the entire triune God. And finally, number four. We take hold of God when we truly believe that God answers prayer. Psalm 65, 2 says, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. You see, too often we pray, but we don't really believe it. We're surprised when God answers. And that's not unusual. That was true in Bible times as well. I mentioned Thomas Watson's statement that the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but prayer fetched the angel. Well, when Peter escaped from prison... And he came back to the disciples. Remember, there was a little girl that came to the door. And she was so astonished it was Peter. And the disciples couldn't believe it was Peter. Peter was released from prison. Well, they had prayed for it. So even the disciples were surprised when their prayer was answered. God is mindful of our human infirmity. But we need to believe. We need to believe that He's a God not only that gives prayer and moves us to prayer and hears our prayer, but also answers our prayer. I love the story of the man who once set up a tavern next door to a church. The wild parties, the late night hours, the sinful indulgence, and the morning garbage from the bar so distressed the church next door that people, under the leadership of the pastor, began to pray that God would somehow intervene. 
And God did. God sent a tornado to that town. And the tornado wiped out the tavern completely. And the church was left untouched. And so the tavern owner took the church to court. And he came before the judge and he said, I'm suing this church because they prayed against my tavern. They're responsible for the destruction of my tavern. And the church in its defense said, we didn't do anything. We didn't touch that tavern. We didn't do anything. And the judge said, this is the strangest case I've ever heard. Here you have unbelievers believing in prayer, and you have believers who don't believe in prayer. You see, we need to believe that God will hear our cries. We need to take hold of Him by faith and trust Him. That He will answer in His time and in His way. And even if He delays us, we still need to believe that He will hear our cries. Well, now let me conclude this message by giving you an encouragement. Probably by this time you're feeling very guilty. And you're saying to yourself... Wow, I don't know. I I don't know how to even begin because I'm so far short of the Reformers and Puritans. Well, and we are. We are. I'm not saying I want want you to leave this this address with, with no guilt. But I don't want you to be overwhelmed with guilt. I don't want you to be overwhelmed and leave this address and say, this is impossible for me to do. We do need to remember that Luther, in his former life, was a monk, and he was used to praying many long hours every day. We do need to understand that certain people have gifts to pray for a long, long time. But don't despair in your prayer life. The main thing, again, is not long, long prayers. The main thing is sincere prayers and to build your prayer life and see its importance. God can turn you into an Elijah who truly prays in your prayers. God can move you to be a prayer warrior for the church of Jesus Christ. Pray for grace to believe and be thankful that God decrees and gives and hears and answers prayer. And be determined, be determined that you will undertake the journey from prayerless to prayerful praying that you will become contemporary Elijahs who, like the Reformers and Puritans, truly pray in their prayers. And be convinced that if you fail in prayer, you fail in all. So bring back priority in your prayer life. Let the Puritans teach you the value, the importance, the trials, the warfare, the enabling spirit the Spirit of God, for prayer. And then ask God to make you, to make you a praying Elijah who knows what it means to battle unbelief and despair even as you strive to grow in prayer and in grateful communion with God. Let's pray together. Great God, forgive us for all our prayerlessness. Forgive us for being more active in the church than active at the throne of grace. Lord, we think of the ministry of thy word, that the very office of deacon, deaconry was established so that ministers could give themselves to prayer and to preaching. So please help us to understand the importance of prayer in every form of ministry, in every form of the Christian life. Make us, keep us as prayer warriors at thy throne. Teach us how to take hold of ourselves and how to take hold of Thee in prayer. And Lord, grant that we too may be among that happy people who take the kingdom of heaven by violence through the great gift of Spirit-worked prayer. So humble us and help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.